You all catch fireflies when you're kids? If you did, you know you have to have a lid on the jar or the fly, fireflies are going to get away. That's the same principle that's in play here. You are listening to History Man, the platform for historians, curators, and authors to tell their stories of the American Revolution, walk in the footsteps of heroes, and proclaim freedom reigns. We are with Jack Parker as he unveils his fourth edition of his book, Parker's Guide to the Revolutionary War in South Carolina. This book, put out by Harrelson Press, is considered the Bible of the Revolutionary War in South Carolina. Harrelson Press Publishing out of Columbia, South Carolina, can be found on Facebook and Twitter. If you like walking in the footsteps of our Revolutionary War heroes, this is a must-have book. We continue as Jack walks us through his research into British Major James Weems in the attempts to trap the swamp fox, Francis Marion. All right, it's your turn to read. I didn't know about this one. <laughs> Cornwallis sent Major James Weems against Marion to burn the homes of Marion's men and hang those he caught. Marion decided to break up his militia and flee to the White Marsh, North Carolina. Weems used loyalist Captain Amos Gaskins, who was an evil man whose soul had been soiled by hatred, to identify the rebel homes and cause the Presbyterian Church at Indiantown to be burned. Weems killed sheep and cattle and destroyed mills and blacksmith shops and allowed British units to plunder at will. And hung Adam Cusack for breaking parole and deserting the British Navy and burned the home of Dr. James Wilson, who attempted to prevent Cusack's hanging. In Weems' words, burnt and laid waste about 50 houses and plantations, mostly belonging to people who have either broken their paroles or oaths of allegiance and are now in arms against us. The list was found and destroyed by General Thomas Sumter at Fish Dam Ford, Weems described his orders as a very disagreeable but necessary duty. I'm going to throw one thing in here. Sumter did burn the list that he found in Weems' pocket. The reason he burned it was if any of his men ever found that list, they would have hanged Weems. Weems was a good candidate for trading to the British, so he had to keep him alive. That's why the list got burned. But he burned approximately 50 plantations. Why did Weems fail to capture Mary? Now here, you have to apply a little bit of thinking between the lines. Poor coordination between Ganey, who lived on west on Catfish Creek. That's in Marion County, just north and west of Marion. Underestimating Mary, that's a big factor. And Blue Savannah. You all catch fireflies when you're kids? If you did, you know you have to have a lid on the jar or the fly, fireflies are going to get away. That's the same principle that's in play here. Now, you see the, maybe it's hard for you to see up there. The red line, the black line, and the blue line. The red line are the British forces. The blue line that goes up the Little PD is the Georgetown militia, what's left of it. The kind of blue dot with a line down is where Katie lived on Catfish, Catfish Creek. And way up, here, way up here, you see a little tiny red dot I don't know if you can read it from where you are, but the name is Barfield. That's where Barfield lived. Everything I ever read didn't mention Barfield until about a week ago. I found a pension statement from the wife of somebody, and I'll get into that later when we get there. So anyway, this is the whole route that shows you where everybody was and they went. Now we'll break it down. I'll read this one. You go for it. <laughs> Remember we, we talked about the 200 from the Maryland line that Marion captured? That's what his first sentence is about. I sent the prisoners I took on the 25th of August with the Continentals to Wilmington. This is a letter written by Marion on 915 
Blue Savannah happened on 9-4. So it's within two weeks of the action. This is about as good a source as you can get. On the third instant, I had advice that upwards of 200 Tories intended to attack me the next day. And this is where they didn't count on Marion. I immediately marched with 52 men, which is all I could get. On the fourth in the morning, I surprised a party of 50, 45 men, which I mistook for the main body. Let me explain, and you'll see it on maps later. That was the advance guard for Gaines troops. And they would have been camped on the north side of the creek because they wanted to keep water between Marion and them, just in case. I killed or wounded all but 15 which escaped. I then marched immediately to attack the main body, which I met about three miles in full march toward me. Remember that part. We're going to look at the old historical marker and some of the mistakes in it. I directly attacked them and put them to flight. Though they had 200, I got and got into an impassable swamp to all the Tories. And I had one man wounded in the first action, three in the second, and two horses killed. Finding it impossible to get at them, I retreated to camp, went back to Port Sperry. The next day, I was informed they were all dispersed. On the 5th, I was joined by about 60 men. I then withdrew, I then drew up a small redoubt to secure my camp from being surprised by the Tories should they again collect. Those Tories were scattered so bad, they never again became a fighting force. And they were on Highway 41. Now you can see where the advance guard is at the lower star on Reedy Creek, keeping the creek between them and Marion. Blue Savannah is up where the upper star is, was on 9-4. If you measure that on a map, depending on how good you are, it's exactly 3 miles or 3.1 miles. So his that? Estimated three miles were pretty close. And you can you can see Marion up there. And on the left hand side, well, maybe it's your right hand side. Uh Gaines uh, Catfish Creek. Marion County was a hotbed for Tories and Loyalists. Uh, just north of Marion, there was a Tarts Mill. That was another hotbed. They're the group that went up and killed Colonel Cobb in Marlboro County. So, but in all my reading, I never found anything until a week ago that had mentioned Barfield, except for the historical markers. And you can see at the top other corner, uh, Barfield lived way up Highway 41. These are what uh, savannas look like. There's three of them. These three are on the north side of Highway 501. And you can see in the lower part, it says Blue Savannah is a Carolina Bay. A Carolina Bay is made up like this. It has a sand ridge. Uh, it's got, most of them have water in it and they have gravel and sand at, on the bottom. Now, this one, you can see Blue Savannah. I'm going to run the pointer around it. Can you see the sand? So it's, it goes from about here to here. And Highway 41 went through the middle. It got its name, Blue Savannah, from the blue-gray clay 
that stuck to the wagon wheels when they would go through it. It had about knee-deep water in it. This is the, the original sign. This was there maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago. One quarter mile south of the site, Francis Marion defeated a band of Tories under Captain Barfield on August 13th. Number one, I never read anything that said Captain Barfield, except this. The date's wrong. He feigned a retreat. That's wrong because Marion said, I attacked them straight on. <laughs> so he didn't draw them into a trap. Oh, that sign was relocated when they made Highway 40, 501 four lanes. And they didn't put it back at Aerial Crossroads, which would have made it a quarter mile south. Instead, they put it about a half a mile toward Myrtle Beach. And being young and dumb, I drove a big van back in there and discovered that's back bay. And the ditches that they put in are about eight feet deep. And it's wide enough for one car to go on the ridge with a ditch that deep on both sides. So don't drive in there. <laughs> uh, I, they made a new historical marker, and I didn't have a copy of it. I hadn't photographed it. But Bill Seegers, I hope I said his name right, uh, they're photographing historical markers all over the state. He sent these to me. This is the new one. And it is on Highway 41, not at the crossroads, but almost exactly where the action took place. And I'm gonna, I need to explain to you where it took place. Blue Savannah is a big area. But you gotta remember, Marion is coming up from the south. Uh, Ganey and Barfield are coming down from the north. And when he attacked them directly, why didn't they run back up the road? Because they were on the south side of the Savannah. The clay and the water would have slowed their horses. That's where you have to put a little common sense into some of these actions. You won't find it, find it written down word for word. You have to think about it. So that's why they turned and went into Back Swamp, because it was the only avenue they had. To turn the other way would have been high ground, and they probably would have been caught and a lot more killed. Uh, do you want me to read the historical marker, or have you read it? I guess you've all read it, right? Okay. Uh, anyway, this one says Captain Jesse Barfield again. So I got the, I went online, and previously, I've been doing this for about 22 years, I had never found anything that had Barfield being a commander. Except when I went online, I found a pension statement from, well, let me go, let me see, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the back side of the sign. In the second skirmish, roughly three miles, which it was, uh, in the vicinity of Carolina Bay, known as Blue Savannah, Marion again attacked and dispersed a larger uh, detachment of t about 200 loyalists. Marion's victory was encouraged, here encouraged uh, new recruits to join his force, which they did, because about 60 people joined him. But this next statement I take issue with. The reinforcements of local Tory militia, they weren't Tory militia. It was a British army with wings and militia. However, soon forced the Patriot leaders to withdraw from here up to North Carolina. Uh, maybe some of you noticed I'm doing a lot of shaking. I have a central tremor. My hands never stop. And it gets worse as you get older. 
I'm at the age now where I can no longer put red lines over these roads. It comes out a mess. So this is something that I just added in the last week. It shows you where Ports Ferry was. And Marion would have taken the road from Ports Ferry up to Highway 41 and taken Highway 41 up to the advance guard on the north side of Reedy Creek, which he killed about 30 of them. 15 got away. And then three miles up to, to Blue Savannah. Now this, this is, it may be an 1825 map. It shows black uh, back swamp, kind of narrow. It's not, it runs almost up to Highway 41. There's enough room for one row of houses between the swamp and the road. So they disappeared into the swamp. Marion did chase them in there. You can see it would be high ground if they had gone the other way, or they had to be on the south side of the swamp because of the clay in the water would have slowed them down. So if any of you are metal detector people, go up there, look around the new sign that's up, you're going to find some artifacts. Got to be. And that sign, that uh, savanna where you could barely see the sand rim, that's after 250 years of plowing and planting. So it's, it's still there. This is just a close-up. And the thing you want to notice is B, Muron, you see that on the long side of the road? He lived there. He was one of Mary's officers. And I didn't know that until about a week ago. His wife filed a pension statement. Back during the revolution and after that, pension statements now would be called Social Security. Uh, people that fought in the revolution could get a pension, and after they died, their wives could get a pension. His wife filed for a pension 65 years after the Battle of Boozman. You look like you know it is. Uh, anyway, uh, I have a copy. I didn't put it in this presentation, but I have a copy of that. Uh, I think she made it in 1846, maybe, or 45, and you always had to have a witness on a pension statement that said, this happened, it was true, these people were involved, and so he should get the pension. The person that gave the witness was dated a year later, so it made me suspect. Number one, wives are not really good at remembering things because the husbands are actually the ones who did the fighting and they would remember, I got shot or almost shot, whatever. But being that B. B Moonerman, his first name was Benjamin Moonerman, was one of the people involved in Blue Savannah. And the fact that it was his wife She's the only one I ever met to mention Barfield. So her husband must have told, him, told her that Barfield was part of the group. And that may, that may be the last slide. Oh, here we go back with all those things again. Uh, Hunt's Bluff is right up there where the pointer is, that blue star. That's the first thing that got Cornwallis excited. Then the next thing is all the way down at the bottom where it says Great Savannah. That was a month later when 200 of the Maryland line were captured, <coughs> taken away from the British by Marion. And then you can see the high hills of the Santee. The red line is Weems March. Weems actually got to Sherall uh, on the 10th of September, but he didn't write a letter to his boss until the 20th. 
And the reason being, he had to wait for all the other troops to come in that were burning down different plantations and that sort of thing. So, just like your firefly jar, you had three forces coming up from the south. So Mary could have just run two north and stayed ahead of them. But Blue Savannah, and I have found nothing to back this up. Maybe one of you has, but there's no doubt in my mind it will show up sometime in the future. Highway 41 goes to White Marsh, and that's where Marion fled to. He just went up Highway 41. Blue Savannah happened on Highway 41. So I think that uh, Gaines Force and Barfield were to work in conjunction with Weems. Weems was commanding all these people coming up from the south. But it took him seven to seven and a half days to leave the high hills. Now, I, I got wondering why he took so much time. He, well, granted, he had militia ordered to accompany him, to accompany him, but as best I can determine, all of, they, all of them were within 30 miles of the high hills. And uh, Times, three weeks after this happened, Times was involved in the Battle of Jericho Swamp. So he was down in Clarendon County, in that area, around Marion, uh, that sort of thing. I have nothing official that ties Ganey to Cornwallis or to Weems, but there's no doubt in my mind it had to be coordinated. Otherwise, Marion would have just gotten away. And the British knew where Marion was, too. That's why Weems crossed at Britain's Ferry and then came back. He wanted Marion to think, we got a river between us, I'm safe. And I think that's it. Oops. We've got a little more for the reader here. Thank you. <laughs> Major James Weems received his orders on August 29, 1780, when he was in the high hills of, Santee, of the Santee. He did not march until September 5, 1780. This delay may have caused him to arrive in the area of Ports Ferry too late to trap Marion with Ganey closing the top of the trap. Or perhaps Ganey marched too soon. He may have been ordered to get close to Marion and monitor his position, etc., until Weems arrived. In any case, Weems and Ganey underestimated <coughs> Marion. Marion learned of Ganey's plans planned movements and marched to take the fight to him on September 4th, 1780. The result was a total surprise to Ganey and the lid to Weems trap was eliminated. When Weems arrived on September 9th, 1780, Ganey's men had been so badly scattered that they were no longer a fighting force, leaving the road to White Marsh, North Carolina open that allowed Marion's escape. If Blue Savannah had not happened or been lost by Marion, the outcome of the Revolutionary War may have been very different, since there would have been a real possibility of Marion's capture by Weems, who had orders to hang him. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> there was something else I was going to say, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> Getting old is not fun. Your mind goes to pieces. Uh, I, I really think, and this is just my personal opinion, remember in the beginning I told you Weems was Cornwallis' fair hair boy? I think Weems kind of had the thought in the back of his head that I can do no wrong. It, it doesn't, if, if he had marched in about three days, which is normally what it takes to, actually they, May camp and road camp on marches every day. So three days is generous time to, to march. That would have put him there right at about the time of Blue Savannah. But he didn't. He, he waited to march. And then uh, 
I went back and checked the dates of when Gates came into South Carolina. He came in about the 25th of July, which is, what, 10 or 12 days before we, uh, yeah, we was March from Georgetown and got as far as Nelson's Ferry and it was all over. So he seemed to be rather slow and I don't know when he got his orders from Georgetown to go to Canada. Uh, there must be a date somewhere. But in both cases, he seemed rather slow to me to decide to get up off his duff and march. Anyway, had he left sooner, he, they would have probably gotten married. But the big thing that they did not count on was Marion. He took the fight to them. Everybody expected him to stay seated where he was, maybe throw up a little defensive mound or something. But he went with 52 men against 200. And he totally surprised them because they didn't think he was going to do it. And he threw out his campaign, he did things like that. One comes to mind that he was somewhere up around Berkeley County and went 60 miles in one night to attack the enemy. They didn't expect it. He won. Except he did play a, a busket, busket, tea, busket there, ambush. But he always did the unexpected. And I think the British and the Tory militia had a hard time accepting all of that. Uh, and there's the grand old book. <laughs> if you have any questions about it, maybe they'll answer them. If you have any questions about any of this or anything else, I'll be here until the last of you leave. So feel free to ask away. Thank you.